Registrations are now open for the 5th Bioceuticals Research Symposium to be held in Sydney on the 20th to the 23rd of April 2017. To register, please click on the Education tab at bioceuticals.com.au. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. And with me on the line today, all the way from wintry Ottawa in Canada, is Dr. Carrie Drisker. Dr. Carrie Drisker is known internationally as the functional medicine doc, the go to expert on finding the root causes of health problems so you can feel normal again. She's a chiropractor and a naturopathic doctor host of the popular podcast, The Functional Medicine Radio Show, and author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again, Fixing the Root Cause of Your Fatigue with Natural Treatments. Dr. Carey is creator of Entrepreneurial Fatigue, How to Fuel Your Brain and Body for Entrepreneurial Success. Her private practice is Functional Medicine Ontario, located in Ottawa, Ontario. And I warmly welcome Dr. Carey Driska to FX Medicine. How are you? I'm excellent, Andrew. It's such a pleasure to be on FX Medicine today. Now, today we're going to be talking about that shadow that plagues all of us at some time in our lives and some of us all the time, and that is fatigue. But fatigue can take so many mantles. So I guess we've got to start off with a bit of a definition. What is fatigue versus just being tired? Oh, you know what, Andrew? I think that's a great place to start. So I think from a clinical standpoint... Um, energy and fatigue is on a continuum, right? So Mm -hmm. at the far end, you have, you know, abundant amounts of energy. And then uh, people start feeling, you know, tired. And I I think when people say tired, to me, that is just like a temporary thing. Yeah. Might be a temporary situation because of a little bit of stress they're under or because they skipped a meal, because they had a bad night's sleep. But when people then start feeling tired day in and day out, and I think this is where patients get caught up is now they're feeling day in and day out, they're feeling tired and they don't realize, well, well really they've transitioned to, I'm just tired to, now I have fatigue, which is one of the consistent thing happening day in and day out. And then of course, as a continuum continues, you know, over a course of months, mm. it starts to become chronic. And then the true definition of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome so di- the diagnostic criteria, and this is from the Mayo Clinic, yeah. um, chronic fatigue syndrome, you must have unexplained persistent fatigue for six months or more, along with at least four of the following signs and symptoms. And they are loss of memory or concentration, sore throat, enlarged lymph nodes in your neck or armpits, unexplained muscle pain, pain that moves from one joint to another without swelling or redness headache of a new type, pattern, or severity, unrefreshing sleep, and the last one is extreme exhaustion, lasting more than 24 hours after physical or mental exercise. Mm. So fatigue, there's a real continuum to it. And I would say in my private practice, a small percentage of my patients have what would be considered clinically as chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah. A much larger percent of them have just generalized fatigue, mm. uh, you know, for, quote, no apparent reason. Mm. Well, <laughs> yeah, there's always a reason. It's just whether we can find <laughs> Except it. Except there's a reason, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I remember talking to two doctors once about um, somebody dying. And, you know, it, it just happened quite suddenly to this patient. And they said, you know, sometimes things just happen. And I said, no, they don't. Things happen always for a reason. It's just whether we're alert enough. <laughs> to be able to deduct what went That's on. Right. You know, there's always something. There's That's always right. some antecedent. So I, I I know this is going to be a piece of string question, but what's the prevalence of fatigue? Has anybody looked at that in our society? Oh, you know, that's another great question, Andrew. And when I was doing some research into fatigue, I honestly didn't find any real statistics yeah. out there for just plain old fatigue. It's like... It's like this whole area of um, 
of health care, of, of people having this illness, as we'll call it, that's just not being recognized. Mm. At least that's how I see it in North America. Mm. I'm trying to think medically and I'm trying to think there's no way that they'd throw money at something that they can't treat when you've got no specific treatment for it, you know? Like they can't box it into one thing. And I guess this is the issue with fatigue is that it can take on so, uh, maybe I should word that another way, fatigue can pr be a, the pre the manifestation from so many different causes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll you're, exactly, you're exactly right. There's a lot of different underlying factors, underlying reasons why people have fatigue. Yeah. And you're right from, from the current medical model, which in, in Canada, especially is like when you go see your family doctor, you can only have one symptom <laughs> on that visit and that's all they're going to have time for. Yeah, yeah. You just talk about one symptom. Mm. And the reality is the average uh, patient that sees a functional medicine practitioner, on average, they already have six diagnoses and over 30 different symptoms. Now that's so something like right I didn't there, know. You can see the yeah, right there you can see that these patients don't fit the yeah. medical model, yeah. and, and that's part of the reason why the medical model is failing them. Uh, and you know what? That is the most common reason that I know of even re um, people who, who seek to become practitioners is because the medical model has failed them personally, and they've searched, they've looked for another sort of alternative. So I've got to that's ask, exactly though. exactly right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've, I've got to ask, though, that, you know, People then would cycle at just a new normal, a bad normal, if you like, a lower level of energy chronically. So, the, you know, I'll call it the new normal. Um, how do you, how do you try and wake people up and say, no, no, it doesn't have to be like this? Well, that's a great question. I think, you know, I think for a lot of patients out there, and this includes practitioners too, because we are patients also. Oh yeah. Um, we all have our own kind of a, we all have our breaking point or our, you know, hitting quote rock bottom where we just say like, I can't, this is, this is just not acceptable. Like my level of energy day in and day out is just not acceptable. I'm tired of dealing with it. No pun intended. I'm sick and tired of trying to deal with it. And I want to start finding answers. I think people usually get to that point and start and start looking for answers. But before that, they're just kind of going through life. And, and I just see this with patients and what they tell me is that they just feel like they, they make excuses. Well, you know, I'm stressed or I'm just getting older. Mm. This is just a part of getting older yeah. or, um, you know, or sometimes too with, uh, unfortunately, you know, patients come to see me and they've, usually already seen their family doctor and a couple of specialists and a couple of other naturopaths by the time they see me. And, and oftentimes somewhere along the way, it's like somebody tells them, well, you're just, you're just a busy mom. Like this is just because you're busy in life. Yeah. And, and, and I think for a while there, people kind of buy into that, you know, those excuses, but then they do get to a point where they're like, this is enough. Yeah. Like, I can't go on the rest of my life. You know, they can kind of for, foresee the next five, 10 years or 20 years. And they're thinking, man, I, I want to live life again. Where did my energy go? And then the flip side of that too is Andrew, people don't really, people don't realize how bad they are until they start feeling good again. Yeah. Uh, and I no. hear that over and over in my practice. They're like, wow, Dr. Carey, you know, I didn't realize how bad I really was. Yeah. Like, that was really bad. And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. But, <laughs> you know, from their point of view, when, when you have that fatigue day in and day out, it just, it does, you know, quote, become your new normal, as, yeah. as you said. Yeah. And, and I guess one of the factors here, and, and I don't, do not know how to measure this, is resilience. Everybody has a different resilience. Like, for instance, my wife, she's just, in, she's an incredible, incredible lady. And she has this innate resilience in her, whereas I'm a wimp. <laughs> so, and, and it's just, I just, I just find it funny, you know, like my wife, Lee, she will just push on through anything. And yet I will go, uh -huh, uh -huh, I'll go, want to go to bed and suck my thumb sort of thing. Can you give me some soup? 
<laughs> How do you? Well, I don't want to make any generalities here, Andrew, <laughs> between women and men. <laughs> the man <laughs> called. But you're right. There is, there is that that unknown that unknown factor of constitutionally, some people can uh, handle a lot more than others. Yeah. Whether it's stress or whether it's um, an infection load in their body or a toxin load in their body or whatnot, you know, just some people are just, they're just hardwired to be able to handle more than others. Yeah. And, and is there, have you ever discovered any way of differentiating, of sort of assessing, you know, for instance, um, let's say it's even a guess of what somebody's resilience should be like. So therefore, how much, war, how far worn down they are from where they should be. I know that's a, again, it's a bit of a sort of crystal ball sort of question, but, you know, like, I, I guess yeah, one, of, you, one of the places no I'm going idea. here is a that's bit esoteric. That's a great esoteric. question. I have no idea. Well, one of the one of the places I'm going here is a bit esoteric, and I, and I always vacillate okay. here between my sceptical mind and yet what I've seen, and it's like the thing of iridology. Yeah. You know, and my nursing yeah. says it's a load of rubbish sort of thing, and yet I've, I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen practitioners use it, and I... I've even practiced it, not as an expert, I've practiced it and been able to pick out some weird stuff where people look at me quizzically like, you know, have you been checking my background? <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't understand it. Have you ever used that to say, listen, you are really, you know, you've got a, a silk iris and you should be really, you know, quite resilient. So you must be therefore worn down. Have you ever used anything like that? Um, to be quite honest, No. No, and besides iridology, which you just taught me something right there, because I really don't know much about iridology. I really don't know of any other ways to kind of assess something like that. Mm. So thank you for teaching me something here today. Well, it's not necessarily. I'm I'm still skeptical, but I'm just like quizzical about it. You know, like oh, hmm? I understand. You know, um, I and, guess and that's a good practitioner, right? To to have a healthy level of skepticism. Yeah, but to that's you a know, really good. I guess you know, I'm, practitioner. I guess I'm brave enough now to be able to explore a couple of things that you know, just because I don't know about it doesn't mean it doesn't work. <laughs> but what about um, taking a detailed family history then? That must be important, of course. Yeah, so that's one of the things that I always ask and any good practitioner should be, you know, looking into the family history because that can start giving you some clues as to what may, might be going on in the background. If there's, you know, a history of thyroid problems or autoimmune disease or... um uh, celiac, which celiac can actually manifest in many different ways hmm. without being all the overt celiac disease, you know, as diagnosed, can sometimes manifest as um, addictions um, and mental emotional problems, you know, that run in families, anxiety, depression, yeah. um, bipolar disorder. There's, you know, I think a lot of the practitioners know out there are understanding that celiac disease really um, affects the brain and the nervous system more so than any other part of the body. So when I when I look at the family history, those are some of the things that I'm kind of looking at to see, huh, are there any hints within within these issues that might be present in my, you know, the patient in front of me? So let's go into some of these causes, because as we said before, there are many, but some of the main causes mm -hmm. of fatigue that you cover in your book, you know, reclaim your energy and feel normal again. Okay. So in my book, I outline eight of the causes, eight of the 14 um, that I really, you know, looked into. And at the top of the list are um, anemia and thyroid problems. And I would say of anybody out there that has fatigue, those two really should be the first, first things assessed. And then after that, you know, the rest of the list is just in no particular order, but there's a cortisol imbalance mm. and uh, blood sugar imbalances, uh, nutrient deficiencies, and that's kind of a broad category, chronic hidden infections, food allergies and sensitivities, or just, you know, food reactions in general, yep. and then uh, brain imbalances. Those are the, the big eight that I cover in the book. Yeah. We'll talk about red flags a little bit later because I, I, I want to go through a few of those just for a safety sort of point. But thyroid is, I, I mean, I, you know, subclinical thyroid disease has been a, a huge issue. But what are the causes of the thyroid which cause the fatigue? As a lot of your listeners already know that the majority of hypothyroidism is autoimmune in nature. And that would be as Hashimoto's. Mm. So whenever I have a patient 
with a thyroid problem, that's the first thing I want to assess for is do they really have Hashimoto's or not? Right. And when it comes when it comes to autoimmune disease, I mean that's a whole you know another gamut too of you know where does that come from? So there's that autoimmune component, and then I believe too that you know with the um, increasing burden of toxins in our world that our glandular tissues are some of the most sensitive, and especially the thyroid being one of the most sensitive tissues in the body to be affected. And then, you know, I think getting back to kind of a a little bit of esoteric too, the thyroid, you know, is a throat chakra. A lot of people who don't speak their mind, you know, or don't speak up can tend to have thyroid issues as well. That's a, that's a really interesting thing. You say esoteric and, and, you know, it is, but with regards to Hashimoto's, how do you tease apart or how do you tell if it's not Hashimoto's? What sort of tests do you engage to determine whether it is or isn't? Yeah, so so I think really that that is the the first thing is to just determine does this patient have Hashimoto's or not? And the two big tests, um, one is a TPO or thyroid peroxidase antibody test. And I think it's estimated like 90% of Hashimoto sufferers have that antibody, TPO antibody mm-hmm. positive. And then the other uh, the other antibody that can come up as abnormal is a TG or thyroglobulin antibody. That one is less common as compared to uh, thyroperoxidase. It, that's really the first um, the first step when I have a patient in front of me that I want to see, okay, I'm suspicious that they have thyroid problems and I'll even assess like if I see that their TSH is higher than a 2.0, I'm very suspicious of, I think there might be something going on um, underneath the surface. I'm not necessarily convinced that everything is normal, especially if they're having a lot of thyroid symptoms. So if their TSH is above a 2.0, I'm already kind of getting suspicious, and especially if it's above a 3.0. Yeah. That I'll take that extra step and say, let's see, do they have Hashimoto's or not? And if they do then I know I have to go down a whole other path because now this, this is a whole autoimmune component to their case. Right. And, and the other thing with, with um, thyroid patients, and this is, this is not really talked about so much in the functional medicine realm just yet, is that the thyroid hormones, you know, every cell in the body has receptors for thyroid hormones, um, but the thyroid has a particular importance to brain health as well. Mm. And that when a patient has a thyroid problem, hypothyroidism, that's not being managed or not being well managed, you know, they have a thyroid hormone deficiency, that will impact their brain health, particularly their cerebellum. Mm -hmm. And then with uh, Hashimoto, so whenever you have a patient with Hashimoto's, I'm already thinking, I've got to look at their brain because we know that the TPO antibodies um, cross react with the cerebellar astrocytes, so specific tissues within the cerebellum. And so as that autoimmune process is going on in the body, and as that autoimmune process is killing the thyroid cells, it's also going to be killing off those brain cells as well. And that can be a big part of the patient's fatigue. So I think this is one of the areas where um, sometimes practitioners blame the thyroid a little bit too much. You know, when patients are having, they're feeling tired, they have cold hands, they have constipation, dry skin. I think the thyroid gets blamed a lot, but there's there's many other things that can be involved, and one of them is the brain. And then on top of that, too, Andrew, is that patients can have perfect thyroid, you know, numbers. Yes. And even if they're on medication, like their medication is dialed in really well, but they're still struggling with fatigue. Mm, mm. And one of the things I think of is, man, I've got to look at their brain and see, is that the missing component? Right, okay. So, I mean, see, I see this commonly and hear about it commonly, and that is when people, as you say, their numbers are good, but they're still fatigued. But the the issue is that there's no test that tells you how well that thyroid hormone is working. In, in fact, to me, this the, the best test is the simplest, and that's taking a temperature. Yeah, so taking your temperature is one way to do it. Um, one of the things that I do with my patients, and in um, 
in Ontario as a naturopath, the only thyroid medication we're able to prescribe is desiccated thyroid. Yep. I'll often just slowly, slowly over a period of time, increase their desiccated thyroid dosage. And I really educate my patients um, so that they understand what the symptoms of being over-medicated feel like. And that if they start having any symptoms of being over-medicated, so feeling anxious, feeling wired, um, having insomnia, uh, racing heart, um, even uh, like diarrhea, if they start having any of those symptoms, then they know i got to dial back on yeah. their uh, desiccated thyroid. So it, it's... It's um, it's hard because there's so many different components, but but uh, as you said, uh, body temperature that is one of the components too. Mm. So um, you mentioned the importance of the brain there, and of course that's a huge issue. This is, I mean, I'm going to go back a, a little bit, another step, and that is to talk about stress, I guess, and and how it affects hippocampal volume and things like mm. that. But I just mm-hmm. see that the and I'm not going to say the cause, but one of the main sort of issues that I hear and see with thyroid patients is that they're just, their resilience is gone. They've been under an exorbitant amount of stress or they're not coping with these stressors in life. Do you see that or do you see other, like you mentioned toxins, for instance, and this is something I have never really investigated with in, with thyroid. So, yeah, as you were saying that, uh, we know from the research, and you know, that was from Oh, I mean, I'm going to brain fart here. Seeing your moment. Oh, darn it. Anyways, that he did a lot of uh, research on uh, the effects of cortisol on the brain and particularly the um, hippocampus and that it, uh, cortisol atrophies, you know, the brain and particularly the hippocampus. A lot of people, they have this vicious cycle going on in the brain and they're, tr- they're like treating the adrenals and treating the adrenals and treating the adrenals, but it's really, you know, part of the component is in the brain and I think really up until more recently, you know, there's, as you know, and a, a lot of your listeners out there know that there's a, there's a lot of research going on about the brain right now. Mm. Very exciting stuff. But really up until recently, um, medicine, including functional medicine, has kind of been uh, from the neck down. You know, we've kind of forgotten about the whole brain and nervous system component of it. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, one of the interesting chemicals to me is brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. And, you know, the simplest things like exercise, love, sunlight, (laughs) painting, relaxation, they can improve BDNF. Do you ever measure BDNF when you're looking at chronic fatigue? Well, I... I always think about BDNF. I'm not sure it can actually be measured to tell you the truth, yeah, but I'm, I'm always thinking about it. Yeah. I've, I've never, <laughs> so never I'm, even I'm thought about measuring. I'm happy that you brought that up. So what sort of, what sort of tests do you engage then to, to look at ha- measuring stress? It's hard to measure stress, you know? Um, you know, people think, or, you know, doctors think that cortisol, you know, is, is one way to measure stress from, a, you know, an analytical laboratory method and then there are just uh you know on a scale of zero to ten how stressed are you feeling today and uh, doing inventories of you know stressful events in the patient's life and i think i think they say at the top of the list is um divorce and then uh, death death or illness of a spouse um things like that Mm. So those are, you know, some of the things to look at for stress, but then all of these other components of fatigue and my gosh, Andrew, there's so many different tests that could be done and it really just depends on the patient, you know, in front of you. So, you know, going back to the kind of the general eight, there's, you know, testing for anemia, for sure, everybody, you know, needs to run a CBC on their patient, but not just the CBC because the CBC by itself could look normal even if the patient has iron deficiency and B12 deficiency, remember they're going to cancel each other out, the microcytic hypochromic anemia and the macrocytic um, hypochromic anemia. Yeah. Uh, I should say macrocytic hyperchromic. Yeah. Um, they kind of cancel themselves out on the CDC. So I think a really good doctor is going to run a CDC plus ferritin and iron, so serum iron, TIBC, transferrin saturation. And then, uh, you know, B12, 
When do you test for B12? Do you test test for um, like holo, holo transcobalamin? A- any other tests to look at how the B12 is being used in the body? You know, generally I start with just uh, serum B12. Uh-huh. And then I'll often also test homocysteine. Because homocysteine as a marker, we can use that kind of as a functional marker for how well is that patient's methylation pathways mm. functioning. Yeah. And of course, B12 is part of that whole um, series too. So yes. I'll look at B12, I'll look at homocysteine, and of course, whatever the CDC is telling me. Yeah. And then if I need to get more fancy, more advanced than that, I'll look at a methylmalonic acid. Right. Okay. So, so you'll leave that for later on, the MMA. Yeah. 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 Yep, cool. And so with, uh, I guess, the issue here, I, I won't talk figures because there's going to be a, a vast difference. Do you use the empirical um, measures over there or stand, um, standard international SI units in Canada? <laughs> in Canada, we use standard international units. Oh, do you? Okay. For the most part. Okay. Yeah, for the most part. On, on certain labs I'm looking at within that, you know, quote, normal lab range, I'm looking especially for thyroid numbers. You know, within that normal range, what are the more ideal numbers? Yeah. So I guess if we, if you wanted to talk numbers, we could, we could try. Well, just a little bit with anemia. Is there any flags rather than you know, um, you know, one up and two down sort of thing? You know, with when you're looking at ferritin, hemoglobin, and and iron and things like that. Have you ever um, okay. looked at any numbers that you, where you sort of go, hang on, red flag here? What's going on? You know, generally with uh, those numbers, I'm looking for the reference range. Yeah. And uh, ferritin, the other thing we have to think about with ferritin is is that, you know, traditionally we've been taught that ferritin is iron in storage in the body. But the other component of ferritin is that ferritin can also act as an acute phase reactant. Uh So when there's inflammation in the body, especially acute inflammation, that will raise ferritin levels. So that's why when I'm looking at a patient's blood work, I'm not just testing ferritin, but I'm also looking at serum iron and TIBC and transferrin saturation. So I get a real, the full story on what's going on with the iron. Yeah. Because sometimes just looking at that ferritin can be tricky. So causes of uh, of ferritin as a, an acute phase reactant, like infections? Yeah. So I'm looking for infections and that might be an acute infection or it might be a chronic low grade infection, like a gut infection, uh, SIBO, parasites, um, yeast overgrowth. Um, that, that's usually the first thing that comes to mind. Right. And then there's, of course, just generalized inflammation that, that can occur because of, you know, people eating an unhealthy diet, a lot of inflammatory foods in their diet. And then the, the last thing I'll think of, too, is just, you know, a simple omega-3 deficiency. Right. You know, that we, we as a culture, especially in North America, we get so, so much more um, omega-6 fatty yeah. acids in our diet yeah. as compared to omega-3s, and that's going to throw things off. But uh, I'll look at those things, and I'll often uh, also test for some of the markers of inflammation. So that would be... Testing for C-reactive protein or high-sensitivity C-reactive protein, an ESR or set rate. And then um, homocysteine can also act as an acute phase reactant. And then cholesterol is another marker, too, that can be elevated when there's a lot of inflammation in the body. So, you know, we have to remember that looking at labs is an art, right? Yeah. There's a real art to practicing medicine. And that we have to, you know, think about, okay, what is the, what are the patient's symptoms telling me? And then what are these lab numbers telling me? And how do I blend them together to really, you know, it's in the interpretation of it all. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm always reminded of a specialist when I worked in intensive care and this, this was a, a specialist caring for an MVA, a motor vehicle accident patient, and um, unconscious, and he took his blood gases, sent them down to the hospital lab. They came back very quickly, which was great, except he took one look at them and said, rubbish, send them to the lab down the road. He knew exactly right on that they were wrong. <laughs> and he sent them to the lab down the road, got a totally different reading. <laughs> 
And, wow. Yeah. So this is and, and that that's an expert. That's somebody that knows their craft. And um mm-hmm. and yeah, he just knew. He just said, no, nah, that's rubbish. So um my my learning point here is when you get uh, orthodox doctors that you know cry blue murder when they talk about integrative pathology testing or functional pathology testing. What a load of pseudoscience and things! I say, well, really, because if you if you do split sampling, you'll see variants in every other pathology lab as well. So, so yeah. it just depends on the de- on the degree of variance. But I was I just thought it was a cracker uh-huh. that this guy could pick it in a second, and said, "No, nah, uh-huh. go and get it tested down the road." So. My lesson uh-huh. there was never let the numbers guide your treatment. Always uh-huh. be aware of your expertise, your clinical expertise. Yeah, and as you said, there are there are very variations within tests from test to test. Even if you split test them, there'll be a certain amount of variation. Yeah, and from lab to lab, and there's always the uh, you know the occasional false positive or false negative. Hmm. So I think, you know, you're not hurting the patient by over-testing either. No, just depends on how much. You want to do your due, <laughs> you want to do your due diligence yeah. and do it in an ethical manner that you're getting the information that you need to make the right decision. Mm. So with regards, you mentioned diet before and how inflammatory it is. I mean, our diet, my goodness, we call this progress. <laughs> High carb, high fructose. Right. I mean, talk about a cause of fatigue. But how big a component is just dietary aberrations? Eating a poor diet, eating a diet that's setting you up for the next sugar swing. How prevalent is that compared to all of these other um, causes? Oh, that's an excellent question. It's definitely a component. And Andrew, I would say when patients walk into my practice, they're usually in one of two groups. One is, They've really never thought about natural medicine or functional medicine, mm. but they're tired of the you know standard medical model, and they they just want an alternative. Yeah, and they've never even thought about their diet. So I kind of have those like very green behind the ear patients coming in, <laughs> and then the other group is you know this whole group of patients uh, that we have now um, because of the internet. You know they go on. They read all these fabulous blog posts. They listen to all of these fabulous podcasts. So they learn about the paleo diet and the autoimmune paleo diet, and they learn about the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting. And so, like, they're very advanced. And yet, even these very advanced patients that seem to be doing all the right things are still, they they get to a point where they just hit the wall and they're just still not progressing when it comes to their energy. So diet is always a factor. The unknown is how much of a factor is it for that particular patient. Mm. Is just addressing the diet alone going to change like 80% of their symptoms? Or is it going to make like only a 10% difference? And even though it's a 10% difference, the patient does not feel any difference. Yeah. But it's always a component. And sometimes we forget about the simplest things. And I've run into that myself. I'm going to admit. Yeah. I've made mistakes with patients where I where I jump into doing advanced diagnostic testing and I need to pull the reins in and just look at, oh, let's just look at their diet. Yep. That's what I missed. And just, you know, like smoothing out their blood sugar, make sure you eat a good breakfast in the morning, mm. you know, making sure you eat, you know, a good lunch, making sure they're eating adequate protein through the day. And, you know, sometimes it's going back to those basics and making sure the patient is doing those basic things can make the world of difference too. Yeah. And even such things as hydration. Yeah, absolutely. I can't tell you how many patients, especially teachers that come in and they're like, yeah, I have no time to drink because if I drink, then I got to go to the bathroom and I just don't watch the kids and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, so then you just kind of throw up your arms and you're like, well, you know, you know what you should be doing. Yeah. And that. You like, just got to do it. There's, there's no thing. out for hydration. And uh, in, in Australia, the. <laughs> no. The largest uh, consumer of alcohol in the world per capita. Uh, I just have to tell our listeners: beer does not equal hydration. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and in North America, I think in North America they say that the number one breakfast drink is Diet Coke or something. Oh, like you're that. kidding! That's ridiculous. Uh, it, it isn't yeah. it? Isn't it just? I have to. I have to tell our listeners of, it, of an, an example. I had somebody who took in. 
a, um, um, forgive me, somebody was billeted to them, an exchange student. Um, they were billeted to them. These children who were primary school age, so they're around the sort of eight, nine um, uh, age group, they had never had a home-cooked meal. Wow. Never, not once, not one, ever. Wow. Never had they had a home-cooked meal, and they were reveling in the taste of this food. They couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. And I was, I I was disgusted, and, and I was just throwing up. I was like, what? How can this be possible? Yeah. I know the, the art of cooking is dying right now. Mm. And you know, much unfortunately, much as much as though I sort of lambasted my wife for watching all these cooking shows, I'll um, you know, I think there's probably some importance to them about how to get back to nature, you know, how to get back to what a what a carrot looks like, where it comes from, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I know. Um, watching some of the information that uh, you know Jamie Oliver, the the, the naked chef there, ja Jamie Oliver going out and just trying to make a difference within the. The education system, when it comes to you know yeah. feeding kids, especially their lunch, just going into you know a, f a class of first graders and showing them vegetables and asking them, "What do you think this is?" and it's like a carrot, <laughs> but they've never seen a carrot before. Yeah, I it... know what you're saying, Andrew. It's like it breaks your heart. Yeah, that's crazy. One of the best things I, I see is that the primary school near us, um, uh, they've got a, a garden there, and the kids actually tend it. You know, so they're they're growing these uh -huh. things that they see in the shot in the supermarket, but um, let's move on a little bit. So you know we've got things like sex hormones, even pain, and chronic infections. You mentioned before, how prevalent uh -huh. do you find these in your practice as the causes of fatigue? I would say in the majority of patients, the majority of them have some amount of chronic inflammation going on. And it's a matter of just figure, you know trying to figure out where's that inflammation coming from. Is it because of a chronic infection? Is it because of their diet? Is it because of hidden food sensitivities? And then um, the other thing is with hormonal imbalance, I, I think as well with the vast majority of patients with fatigue, there is some level of hormonal imbalance going on. And that could be the thyroid, that could be cortisol, and that could be the, the sex hormones estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Um, so so these are things that I always kind of keep in mind, you know, in my head as I'm going through my differential diagnosis list. These are always the things I'm keeping in mind as to what areas am I going to investigate now? Mm. What areas am I going to investigate later? And, and how are these things tied together anyways? And if I fix this one aspect, will it help the others? I think that's an interesting thing you say about prioritizing. Sometimes you just can't do everything at once and you have to put something off. I, th I think it's a, a lot of times. Yeah, that's a, and it's a yeah. real knack to be able to tell the patient, look, we may not be able to treat all of your needs right now. We have to do some foundational work first. And that's a bit of an art mm -hmm. in itself, and, isn't and it? So <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I have to convince the patient because they come in and they say, oh, I'm sure it's my adrenals. I'm sure it's my adrenals. Let's test my adrenals. And I look at them and I say, well, I'm sure it's your adrenals too, but the question is why? Yeah. Why is it your adrenals? I'm sure if we test your adrenals, they're going to come back really lousy. But that's not going to tell me anything I'm already suspicious of. Yeah. The question is why? And then they look at you and you can see the light bulb, you know, going off. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. And I say, you know, we're going to address these other things now. That should make your adrenals a little bit better. And then in the future, we'll test your adrenals and see then where are we at. Do you and ever? They, they totally understand that. Yeah. Do you ever, like, I'm, I guess I'm thinking about keeping the patient motivated and indeed pragmatically getting them to come back and see you to, to fulfill their treatment. Um, but do you ever look at, or do you ever go through with patients a sort of, Let's, let's call it a contract and say, look, this is what I can do now. And, you know, what are you expecting the results to be? Are you expecting tomorrow to be jumping out of your skin and doing Olympic marathons? Or are you expecting this to be a slow haul? What's your expectations from me? Do you ever go through this sort of thing, questionnaire with your patients? Uh, yeah, I do sort of in a way. So when... You know, when, when uh, somebody wants to become a new patient of my practice, um, they have to go through an application process first. Yeah. 
So I have an application that they fill in. It's like 20 questions or so. And one of the questions towards the end is um, something like, uh, what, you know, what are your goals and expectations? Yeah. And, you know, I can kind of, and I, and I do this um, application process. It, I use it as a tool to screen patients to see, am I the right doctor to treat this patient's condition? You know, first and foremost. And then, you know, the second is, is this patient really ready for functional medicine or not? <sighs> Do they think that it's just going to be one visit and they're going to get a magic herb? Yep. And it's just going to be rainbows and glitter after that because that's not being realistic. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you Rain- know? Rainbows, or, glitters, and or, unicorns. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I even recall having one application come across my desk in this this person they had half their thyroid removed 20 years ago, mm. never said why, has been on thyroid hormones since, and her health goal was to regrow her thyroid and get off of thyroid medication. Right, yeah. Okay. So we called her up and we said, we appreciate that, but that's not medically mm. possible. Mm. It's just totally unrealistic. And we're sorry, we can't help you with that because nobody can help you with that. Mm. You know, or, you know, depending. So that's kind of a way that I kind of screen what their expectations are. Yeah. And uh, and if they have what I deem to to be realistic expectations, you know, for sure, you know, we'll call them up and we'll we'll accept them into the practice. But if they don't have realistic expectations, we'll call them and we'll let them know, you know, I'm not really sure if I can help you and this is why. Mm this is what you're expecting. I'm not sure it's that realistic. And here are the reasons why. And sometimes just being really open with that, I would say a lot of times, you know, they're like, oh, okay, well, you know, they really appreciate having that honest, open attitude. Yeah. And then you're also, for people who are, who are really, they're still just looking for that one thing, that magic herb that, you know, you kind of more or less repel them. You're not, you know, you, you as a doctor, you only have so much time yeah, on I'm, this planet to see so many patients. And, and you know, I, I think it's actually got to do with the responsibility, taking the responsibility for their care. And if their best care is for them not to see you and to, you know, for you to let them go to somebody else, then that's really part of that, you know, coming from a place of power. And I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. I mean that as a responsible sort of power. Um, it, it should be mm-hmm. actually part of our responsibility as, as caregivers to say, I'm not the best person to, for you to see, you know, mm-hmm. along your yeah, journey. Yeah, so that's just an example of how I do it in my practice. So, mm. you know, a person just can't call up and book an appointment, you know, tomorrow to be a new patient. No, there's a whole process. Yeah. And that's, you know, they fill in the application and it's really from the from the get-go is, am I the right doctor for this patient? Can I help them? And then it's just nuances after that. Yeah. I think, you know, what I'm hearing here, like what I'm discovering, I guess, in this podcast with you, Carrie, is there's so much about fatigue. It's just almost impossible to cover in in one thing. I'm going to urge all of our listeners to get your book, Reclaim Your Energy, all right? Um, So I think people need to look at getting that book to look, to really delve into all of the reasons and all of the treatments, indeed, that people can can get for their fatigue. But I want to go through a couple of things just before we finish. Um, one of them is things like modification of lifestyle. When how how successful do you find that? I think I think I can always do better. Just like most doctors out there and most health providers, we could always do better at helping our patients with their lifestyle. And I think within my own private practice, that's, that's really one area that I need to work at more. And maybe that means bringing on a health coach or a nutritionist to help with that part of the job. Mm-hmm. And that uh, too, it's, it's a matter of, I think having a really good conversation with the patient to say, you know, going back to diet, for example, I've had conversations with patients where I say, you know, I think, diet is a component. I think there's probably hidden food sensitivities. In fact, here's a study on migraines and they removed these 12 foods and 84, 85% of the patients, um, their migraines got significantly better. Yeah. Would you be interested in doing something like that? 
And a lot of people would say yes, mm. but I've also had patients say no. Yeah. I, I have no, I don't want to change my diet. We're going to do everything else except change my diet. And I'm yeah. like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing with, with exercise. It's like, okay, what are you willing to do? Yeah. Here are the options. This would be the best option. It's up to you. You know, what do you want to do at this point? But I think as long as you work out with them and just say, well, look, I can't give you 100% you know, benefit if you're going to give 50% of the, of the input and, and you know, sort of work into some agreements with that, I think that's a reasonable thing as well. Absolutely. As mm. long as they realize that it's a, real, it's a team effort, I'm, I'm here as, as your team member, not just as your doctor, but this is a team effort, but you, you are the one that has to do the majority of the work. Yeah, that's right. So I have to cover this from a safety aspect. What about red flags mm. of fatigue? And I mean, there's so many different. The, the biggest one that I've you know, run across quite a few times is hemochromatosis. Um, but yeah. even things you know, like, you're right about that. yeah, but even things like, um, you know, an underlying, um, um, arrhythmia or, uh, some other cardiovascular disease that might not have been detected. How do you, or what sort of red flags do you look out for? Oh, that's, that's a good question. That's a really, that's a really good question. So, you know, it, just like anything else, you know, a lot of it goes back to taking a really good history, mm -hmm. you know, on that first visit. A lot of times patients are literally telling you what's wrong if you're taking a really good history. And then, you know, oftentimes, Andrew, by the time a patient comes to see me, they've already seen their family doctor and had a whole bunch of testing done. They've already seen one or two specialists and yeah. had a whole bunch of testing done. They've already seen a couple of naturopaths, too. Yeah. And so then I'm, I'm starting to think of, okay, there are these red flags, but also what is just, what are, what are people just missing? But, um, you know, as a health provider, we always have to be aware of things like cancers and malignancy and whatnot. And, and like I said, with, um, even going back to, we were talking about earlier about the CDC mm. and, and looking for anemia that, uh, I, I find oftentimes, I don't know if it's just North America, but a lot of patients come in and they have iron deficiency. And and I say, okay, your doctor diagnosed you with iron deficiency. Okay, that's great. Now, did your doctor ever figure out why you have iron mm, deficiency? Yes. Yeah. Well, no. They just put me on iron. Like, oh, okay. But, but just so you understand, that's a Band-Aid. And here are the reasons why you might be having iron deficiency. Yeah. And, of course, we know one of those could be. Um, you know, internal bleeding because of a polyp or something yeah, like that, yeah. or an ulcer. And of course, you know, a cancerous polyp would be ooh, the worst case scenario in that, you know, in that regard. Mm. And so I just kind of walk them through, okay, here are the possibilities. And if we really want to get to the why, these are the things that we need to look at. And, and they totally understand that. And then getting back to what you said about hemochromatosis, because I do find that that does come up on occasion. Mm. And I often find hemochromatosis in the earlier earlier stages gets ignored. That that's been my um, that's been my experience with uh, the the medical doctors here. Yeah. If I see a ferritin in a woman in the two hundreds or three hundreds, I'm like, ooh, I think this patient has hemochromatosis. Yeah. You know, and I'm and and I'm looking for reasons. And of course, one of them I'm thinking is they might have a cancer or malignancy going on and I refer them back to their family doctor. So that's the other thing is never be afraid to refer. Mm. If you don't know, or if you just want more answers, mm. never, ever be afraid to refer. Um, and, and at least that you're kind of covering, covering your butt that way. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, but, but I've had patients come back, you know, a couple of years later and they're like, you know what, Dr. Carey, you know how you're talking about iron overload? You know, when I was here a couple of years ago, yeah. Well, my doctor finally just diagnosed that, <laughs> and that's why I'm back because you you told me about that first, mm. and so now I'm back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. E you e never know. Even to th even things that might alert you to think like a more coppery looking skin, uh, a darker looking mm -hmm. skin, that sort of thing, and it might be unusual. You go, hang on. Um, I actually had a practitioner once, a, a natural health practitioner who was diagnosed with hemochromatosis, but of course he was surfing all the time. So it was really hard to for for any practitioner to think, 
you know, to sort of be piqued by um, the coppery looking skin. <laughs> he was just dark <laughs> from tanning. Mm-hmm. It's funny that you say that because I just had a patient who came in a couple weeks ago as a new patient with burning on the bottom of his feet and chronic achy pain in his thighs. And he has a history of low back surgery back in like 2009. But then these weird symptoms have started within the last couple of years. Yeah. And nobody's helping him. Everybody's telling him everything's normal. And I said, okay, well, what, what labs has your doctor run? Well, they scanned my back a couple times and everything's fine. Okay. But what blood work has been run? So he hands it to me. And honest to God, Andrew, this doctor ran a CDC. And that was it. Really? And I, and I looked at him and I, and I got angry. And I said, I'm angry because your doctor, there's so much more to this than just a CDC. I'm angry that your doctor just thinks a CDC is enough. Hmm. So I ran a full panel on the patient and I thought, just came back. His ferritin is in like around 350. And wow. as you were saying, it, having that, you know, tan looking skin. You know, this particular patient, he is a construction worker. And, you know, thinking back to the tan skin, I would have never clued into that because I'm just thinking he's a construction worker. He's outside all the time. That's why he he has tan skin. Yeah. Well, t- no, he probably has iron overload. Yeah, yeah. But impossible so, to pick, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, unfortunately, we you know, we're running out of time. So, I've got to ask for our practitioners – what other sort of resources can you alert them to to maybe get some more ideas about treating fatigue in general? And indeed, there's the they can get your book, can't they, from the website, reclaimyourenergybook.com. Is that right? Yeah, that and they can do? get it from my website, doctor, com, spelled D-R-C-A-R-R-I. Of course, they can find it on Amazon too. Oh, got, gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, and really when it comes to fatigue, Andrew – as of today, I'm in practice now 21 years. It's my 21-year anniversary. Ah, happy birthday. And, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And, and I think back, and I don't know where that 21 years went, yeah. to tell you the truth. And there's a lot, there's a lot of courses that I've done over the years. And uh, not to, like, plug specific courses or specific brands, but I think any courses through the Institute for Functional Medicine – have yeah. really been invaluable. Yeah. And any of the courses that are run by Dr. Detis Karazian have always just totally floored me and exceeded my expectation to a thousandfold. Could you spell so the name please? Dr. Detis D D A T I S. Yeah. And his last name is Karazian. K H A R R A I S. ZN. Wonderful. I'll get, I'll get our listeners to look him up and we'll put some of, uh, if I can get some papers by him, I'll put them up on the FX Medicine website. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, That's yeah. excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andrew, for having me on. Oh, my pleasure, Dr. Carey. It's been great to have you on all the way from Ottawa. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise, your 21 years of expertise in treating people with <laughs> chronic fatigue. And I should, shouldn't say chronic fatigue, but for helping people to get back their energy to to feel normal again. That's really wonderful of you. Oh, thank you, Andrew. This has been such uh, such a fun podcast interview to do today, and I really hope I gave your listeners some good practical advice that they can bring back to their office, you know, to, on Monday morning. Thanks, Dr. Carey. Wonderful. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This is Andrew from FX Medicine. We thank you so much for your support over the last two years. We'd really love to remain clinically relevant to your practice. So if you know of an expert in some area, please let us know. You can contact us on fxmedicine.com.au, Facebook or Twitter. 